Good evening. Welcome. I'm Adam Seagrave, Associate Professor in the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership here at Arizona State University. And I'm very glad you could join us uh, for the fourth event in the School Civic Discourse Project this academic year, a discussion of social pressure and creative freedom in the arts. This year in the Civic Discourse Project, our theme is ideological conformity on campus and in American society. This is the school's sixth year organizing the speaker series for ASU, the Phoenix community, and national audiences as well as we continue to rebuild in-person civic discourse following the pandemic. We're grateful for our continued collaboration with Arizona PBS to record the events in the Civic Discourse Project. We also encourage you to explore the complete video archive of the school's speaker events and webinars available on the SCADL YouTube channel. Uh, and also including all the lecture and dialogue events in the Civic Discourse Project from 2017 onward um, on our website, which is scetl.asu.edu. And now to our panel. I will introduce the panel moderator, Brian Bartoning, and then he will introduce our four panelists. Following the panel presentations and conversation, we will take questions from the audience. Brian Bartning is an entrepreneur, investor, and the founder and president of FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. He also co-founded EOS Products, a personal care brand best known today for its iconic egg-shaped lip balm, as an equity partner and chief operating officer of The Kind Group, a privately held company dedicated to the development and expansion of brands. Previously, Bayan was part of American Express's strategic planning group where he conceived of and patented a new multi-channel system for booking travel and led the launch of a new consumer online travel business as director of new product development, partnering with a major online travel agency. He earned his MBA from Columbia Business School and graduated magna cum laude with a degree in economics and environmental studies from Occidental College. He's an avid traveler with a deep appreciation for cross-cultural understanding and relationships. Please join me in welcoming Kavayan Bartning. Thank you, Adam, and uh, just want to express my appreciation to you and the whole team at Scuttle and uh, Arizona State University. We're very excited. Uh, there's a lot of planning that goes into one of these events, and we're really honored to be here. Um, I uh, will briefly introduce FAIR and um, what the organization is about, and then I'm going to introduce our four panelists. Um, FAIR is uh, a nonpartisan organization um, which is really focused on advancing civil rights and liberties for all Americans and promoting a common culture based on fairness, understanding, and humanity. And really at its core, what we're focused on is promoting what we call the pro-human approach to addressing issues of racism and intolerance. And what that means is really fundamentally recognizing that every person is a unique individual with value and that we're united by our shared humanity. So that's, that's really at the core of everything that, that FAIR um, does. Um, I am going to introduce our panelists. I will start with Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln Jones is the co-founder of American Contemporary Ballet in Los Angeles. Um, Lincoln's acclaimed programming for ACB includes his presentation of Balanchine works and reconstructions of important historical ballets. In recent se seasons, he's presented immersive productions of Inferno, The Nutcracker Suite, and Astaire Dances. Um, Lincoln's known for fostering a cultural community around dance with educational programs that bring audiences further inside the art. Uh, next, we have Meg, uh, Meg Smaker, who is a filmmaker. Um, Meg uh, is also a former firefighter. Um, and after 9-11, um, she moved to Yemen to study Arabic and Islamic culture. And while working there, she heard about a terrorist rehabilitation center in Saudi Arabia that became the centerpiece of a film that Meg produced, um, originally called Jihad Rehab, which is now called The Unredacted. Um, Meg has also produced several short films, one of, mix, one of which, Boxiadora, won Best Short Doc at the South by Southwest Film Festival. Um, the third panelist is Clifton Duncan, who is an actor. 
Um, he's a classically trained actor, earned his MFA from New York University's prestigious graduate acting program, which is a subsidiary of the Tisch School of the Arts. His body of work spans the stage and screen across multiple genres, from Shakespearean tragedy to musical comedy. He's the creator and host of the Clifton Duncan podcast and has a blossoming YouTube channel. And uh, our final panelist is Winston Marshall. Uh, Winston is a British musician, podcaster, and the former banjoist and lead guitarist of the British folk rock band Mumford and Sons. Um, I teased Winston that he's gonna play for us um, today, but he, he didn't think it was funny. Um, uh, Winston's won several awards with Mumford and Sons, including a Grammy and two Brits, and has toured internationally. Um, and since departing Mumford and Sons last year, Winston has founded and hosted Marshall Matters, a podcast on The Spectator that explores taboo issues within the creative industries in a series of interviews with artists, musicians, actors, comedians, and more. Um, so what you'll notice is we have four panelists, four very different, um, you know, coming from four different, four very different genres um, within the arts, um, and really dealing with what what I think we'll all see is the same issue but from different angles. So I'm I'm really excited about tonight's uh, or this evening's uh, conversation. We're going to start by having each of the panelists. Um, speak briefly about their personal stories in the context of the, the topic, which is the unchallengeable orthodoxy in the arts. So we'll start with Lincoln. Okay. Um, can you hear me all right? Um, so I uh, run a ballet company in Los Angeles uh, that I co-founded. And um, in 2016, 2017, some of our grants started to come with uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion requirements, uh, which when I read them, uh, essentially required us to discriminate uh, when we hired, uh, which I wasn't willing to do. So uh, we started losing funding then. Um, in 2020, uh, I don't know if you all remember this, but there was, uh, in, I think it was early June of 2020, um, it became, uh, many arts organizations were posting a black square uh, in support of Black Lives Matter um, after the death of George Floyd. And uh, I, I was told I, I needed to post one and I chose not to, uh, for one, because we didn't support political organizations nor did we comment um, on things like that. We had never posted anything in uh, support of um, acknowledging school shootings or, or anything else. Uh, but what became very clear right away was that the message wasn't you must do this because it is the right thing to do, but you must do it or there will be consequences. And I heard this message from innumerable people who themselves said, I don't agree with this, but you have to do it. And that to me seemed uh, deeply wrong. And uh, after that came demands on, further demands on who we should hire and what kind of even repertory we should do, uh, what we should create artistically. And to me, that seemed also deeply wrong that for myself, the artistic process is one of something like a, a deep soul searching. And it doesn't come from top-down directives. And it seemed to me in history, whenever art did come with top-down directives, it came with grave consequences. So this is also something uh, I refused to do and resisted. Um, you know, I, I didn't go into art because I wanted to do social good. I went into art because I had a compulsion to create. But I did underestimate in that time and the social good that art does do. I think that art functions on a level uh, more fundamental than politics, and it serves a very important purpose in society of allowing us to agree 
on things that we find beautiful or compelling or moving when we might disagree about the more surface level things like how to fix social ills. And for me, the, the real flashpoint came when uh, I was asked to do a podcast um, speaking about my views. And at the time, as far as I knew, no one, no artist in my field or, or the performing arts in generally had spoken about these things um, in a critical way. And I agreed to do the podcast, but right before I did it, I was trying to prepare very carefully what I would say because I didn't want to make a misstep. And I was going over and over in my head, what should I, what should I say, what shouldn't I say? And then I, it occurred to me that this was absurd, that I'm an artist and I'm you know, very much attempting to put my soul out there in my work, and here I am afraid to even say what I think. Um, so I chose to speak then, and it was the best decision I ever made. That's all. You're next. I'm going to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> I can't <be> prepare. <laughs> I'm just going to take notes off yours and just use that in mind. <laughs> I'm reading from the phone if that makes you feel any better. Okay. Um, hello, friends, ladies, gentlemen, and as always, everyone in between. Uh, my name is Clifton Duncan. I'm very, hi there, delighted to speak with all of you uh, today. Uh, I am, or rather I was, a classically trained uh, professional actor, so I really don't need this microphone. Um, uh, that was based in New York City, and as I'm sure you're aware, um, actors are known primarily for speaking words written by someone else. Um, when they're called upon to speak for themselves, I mean, let's be honest, it really doesn't really turn out that great most of the time. Um, <laughs> Honestly, it usually sucks, but um, it's quite an ordeal for the poor people forced to listen. So in that sense, I figure I will open with an excerpt from something written by someone else, and then I will kill that momentum by adding some of my own thoughts. So <laughs> yeah, balance is key, as always. Um, so this is an excerpt from an essay entitled, What Shall We Ask of Writers?, um, which I think you'll find very interesting. <clears throat> <clears throat> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, the artist, by the nature of his craft, is able to show us people in motion. This is why we revere good writers. They let us observe the individual richly in his relation to other individuals and to his society. The artist is most successful who most profoundly and accurately reveals his characters with all their motivations clearly delineated. But the writer who works to serve an immediate political purpose, whose desire is to win friends for some political action or point of view, has set himself the task not primarily of revealing men and society as they are, but rather of winning a point. Our essayist continues, I am not saying that an artist should be without a point of view on life and society, or that his point of view does not inevitably guide his selection of materials, characters, etc., or that any book profoundly written will be without political implications. But there's a difference between possessing a philosophic point of view which permeates one's work and having a tactical ax to grind which usually requires the artificial manipulation of character and usually results in shallow writing. Now, my friends, that was written by a man named Albert Maltz back in 1945. And uh, he was a communist. So can you imagine how bad things must have been for a communist to write a long, scathing essay on how left-wing orthodoxy was destroying artistic expression. Um, yet here we are, nearly 80 years later, and I must say it appears that history, if not quite repeating itself, is sure as hell is rhyming in my point of view. And I find it obscene that modern artists who, of all people, should value the freedom of expression have in service of what they call progress have become uh, some of the biggest opponents of free expression. Uh, they are painfully confused. They call themselves liberal, yet embrace illiberal ideology. They say they're anti-racist, yet vilify whites and tokenize minorities. They combat sexist stereotypes by giving female characters stereotypically masculine traits, which they would otherwise deem toxic if those same traits were possessed in men. And we won't even mention how the very concept of sexual dimorphism, which is perennially rich soil for drama and comedy, is becoming increasingly un-PC. 
In the past few years, we've seen popular franchises from Star Wars and Star Trek to the Marvel movies to most recently Lord of the Rings uh, hemorrhaging audiences. And even comic books and video games have been infected by this orthodoxy, leading to canceled books and low sales. The arts have fallen prey to a quasi-religion which shields itself from criticism by smearing those critics as bigots who want to harm an ever-increasing number of protected groups. Our artists have been reduced to safetyism and cowardice by people whose priority is not, as Maltz wrote, to mirror man and society as they are. To be more specific, the goal is no longer to move the public. It is to move the public to embrace a particular vision of the world, a vision which is ultimately nihilistic, cynical, and ultimately destroys everything it touches. So I wish to warn each of you that that destruction will include the imagination, the psyche, and the very soul of the public itself. And it will lead, consequently, to the demoralization and corruption of our society at large if we don't address it directly and take action. I could say more, but um, I'll leave you with uh, the words of a man named Isidore Schneider, to whom Albert Maltz was responding in his essay, that nothing needs to be politically correct as long as it is true. That's me. Thank you. I believe in you. It's a podium or not the podium? That is the question. Well, that was great, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it um, was. <laughs> you're a humble guy, too. Um, well, I don't know what I can quite add to that, although uh, I would say it's been my observation. I don't know if any. Uh, psychology students here are familiar with personality traits, but there's an off-sited correlation between uh, uh, people being liberal and people being creative. Uh, so it's also normal that communities are prone to groupthink, which is absolutely forgivable. It's a human nature, uh, and it might be forgivable, but it's not good. And what I think we see in the creative industries is a... Uh, <coughs> Groupthink, uh, particularly progressive groupthink, I would say, I would distinguish from being liberal, as, as liberal as I understand as a Brit, is pretty different to how you guys, I think, understand in America, but liberal was probably how you would, you would use the term classical liberal. Um, so in the arts, uh, there are now a growing bunch of hot button topics. Uh, some of them have been described already, I think. Uh, to add to Lincoln's point, I don't know if you remember when the Black Square stuff was going around. Do you remember the band Hanson? Do you know that band? Yeah. yeah American band. Mm, ba, 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 ba. Right. They don't exist anymore. They broke up, but they didn't post a Black Square on their social media in June 2021 because they didn't exist. And their fans were so upset that they hounded them for an apology, even though they didn't exist. So the band had to reform to issue an apology for not putting up a black square even though they didn't exist. That is the sort of insanity uh, that we're experiencing in the creative industries. And uh, I have a podcast where one of the other big ones is the trans issue. And famously, J.K. Rowling is uh, uh, kind of on the, on the forefront of, of taking abuse for being gender critical, not transphobic. And um, people say she's not been cancelled, but actually, if you look at people not wanting to work with her, I would say very much she is being cancelled. Depends how you, you define the term cancelled. Uh, but that's certainly one. Uh, if you look at Israel or Palestine, there is a massive group think on that issue. Um, on the, the sheets, which I'm not going to look at, uh, I, I could reel off. Uh, but there are organizations, group artists for Palestine, such like this, who have uh, thousands of artists sign up and very few sign up for any uh, bipartisan groups on the issue. Um, uh, that's another I example. Um, I myself got caught up uh, on the issue of far-left extremism and Antifa, which is very niche if you're British, because we don't really have Antifa in England. I mean, we do, but uh, we had it about 50 years ago uh, when there were actual fascists. Um, but uh, there was a book uh, uh, ish, uh, published. I think there's now been a couple of books on, on the issue. Um, and I tweeted about the book uh, uh, by an American conservative journalist called Andy No, who'd been attacked by Antifa, reporting on Antifa. 
and um, got severe backlash for going against this. Actually, this ties again back into Lincoln's example because in the book it documents the 19 deaths in the first 14 days of the BLM riots, as well as the numerous businesses, mainly black businesses, which were ruined and destroyed by those riots. But to speak against, say anything against the, the, what happened that summer, uh, got severe pushback. And for me, it meant eventually having to quit my band to protect the band uh, from that abuse. Radio stations said they'd drop the, the uh, band from playing the music. I was due to play a, fe a DJ a festival in the UK. I was dropped from that festival without notice. And uh, various other examples. It's just another exa uh, uh, example of a topic, uh, which is one of those hot-button topics, that if you don't fit the mold, if you don't uh, agree with uh, the group think, there, are pu there is punishment for that. So, um, uh, not quite sure. I've been told there's one minute left, but I'm uh, not quite sure what else to add, but maybe we'll get into the discussion. But uh, I think there's a problem, and um, I would also add that these aren't necessarily, if you take, for example, the what Kanye West has said this, uh, this week, he's various anti-Semitic, very anti-Semitic statements, including that he'd go death con three on all Jewish people, um, uh, and he has been dropped by, uh, I think Adidas dropped him in a deal that's going to cost him about one and a half billion dollars. Gap have said they're going to stop uh, stocking uh, we, uh, Yeezys. And um, so the, there's an example of him not going to say something, but I would say that that is actual hate speech. That is actually not okay that he said those things. So I, I draw the line where there's uh, actual hate and just going against uh, groupthink as, as two distinct, distinct uh, problems. Anyway, uh, I don't know uh, how to round this up, but thanks so much. It's great to be back in Arizona. <laughs> I love your country. I love America. Just nobody left. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. How are you guys doing? Good? Yeah? Uh, I don't like to rehash stuff people are. Raise your hand if you actually know anything about me or who I am. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> but you were paying attention, you were taking notes. So, all that's good to know. I'll just do a quick intro. Uh, so, yeah, I am a filmmaker, but before I was a filmmaker, I was a firefighter. Uh, I was a firefighter on 9 11, California. Um, and before 9 11, if you asked me what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, without hesitation, I would have said to be a firefighter. I fucking loved it. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, that was one. Put one in the swear jar. Uh, Free speech. Can't remember. Uh, they'll, ble they'll bleep that on PBS. Um, but I loved it, and, and every day was, was different. I got to work in a team. Um, I felt like I was making a difference. I know how corny that sounds, but it, it was a really satisfying job to have. And before 9-11, um, I would describe my firehouse as a place of love and support and family. And then 9-11 happened. And I saw that family go from a place of love and support to a place of anger and hatred and bigotry and fear. And nothing I saw on mainstream media explained any of it. So my dad always says there's only three types of people in the world. Those when you hit them, they hit you right back. Those when you hit them, they run away. And those when you hit them, they ask, why'd you hit me? And I've kind of always been in that third camp. And so shortly after 9-11, I started reading about Islam and the history of the Middle East. And I noticed very quickly that the things that I was reading about Islam directly contradicted what I was seeing on mainstream media. Um, after a while, I realized that each one of these inputs of information, be it news or, or books, was information given to me through a filter, someone else's filter. So I decided the only way to answer those questions was to remove the filter. And the only way to do that was to go to Afghanistan myself and poke around. So about six months after 9-11, uh, I went to Afghanistan on my own. And I was immediately humbled by my own ignorance of the world. I, I don't know if you guys, well, some of you are in your 20s, but those of you who are no longer in your 20s, do you remember what you were like in your early 20s? The self-assuredness of your worldview? Um, that got came crashing down that day. And so I realized how ignorant my worldview was and how naive I was. And that kind of sent me on a journey to try to educate myself without a filter. So 
Um, a little bit later, I left the fire service and moved to Yemen to study Arabic and, and a bit of Islam. And I lived there for almost five years. And then after there, there I lived in Qatar for a year. And um, then decided that the stories that I was experiencing in the Middle East weren't being at all represented in mainstream media. So I decided to change careers, and I went from being a firefighter and a fire instructor to a filmmaker. Went back to the United States, uh, got my degree, MFA in documentary filmmaking at Stanford, uh, made a film that won South by Southwest, and then a Student Academy Award, and my career was on the, career was on the uprise, and, and made everyone's list of new up-and-coming nonfiction storytellers, and uh, made my first feature-length documentary which was about the world's first rehabilitation center for terrorists located in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it took me almost six years to make that film, uh, one year to get access, three years of filming, and two years of editing. And to my surprise and elation, the film was accepted into this year's Sundance Film Festival and was greeted with rave reviews across the board. And then a small group of six people decided that, without having seen the film, at the announcement of the film, decided to start attacking the film and accusing the film, even though they'd never seen it, of being Saudi propaganda, of being Islamophobic, of me being racist, because I was not a Muslim, and I was telling the film about Muslims and about terrorism. And I think um, my field in particular, documentary filmmaking, is made up of a lot of people who want to do good in the world, who want to make a difference in the world, which is good. But it's also very easy in that kind of fishbowl and environment to weaponize empathy. And so what had inevitably happened was the small group of people who had not seen the film was able to whip up the kind of support by weaponizing empathy to essentially get the film and be blacklisted. And instead of being a big sale and launching the career of me and everyone who worked on the film, um, we literally had to go into exile. And it wasn't until a couple, like a month ago or two months ago, that I was plucked from obscurity and plastered on the cover of the New York Times. And now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Am I good? Did I make the time limit? That's winner, great. winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> Great. Uh, I'd like to start with a question for Winston. Um, Winston, you're you're from the UK. Um, what are some of some similarities, and what are some differences to these issues of conformity and groupthink in the arts that you're seeing in the UK versus what you're seeing in the US? Uh, there's similarities in uh, how people are hiring on quotas and judging people by uh, their, um, the uh, uh, color of their skin rather than the content of their character, uh, which is always jarred with me. Uh, I remember um, with the, uh, I was doing a, a music uh, radio show with the BBC where we were going to hire in an orchestra and before we did it, the BBC producer, we had a meeting with the producer, and, and she was insistent that we uh, hire uh, the auction not on how talented they were or how good they were, but rather by race quotas. And I thought that was absolutely astonishing, but to my shame, said nothing. And that's, that's the issue of self-censorship that's going on, because, of course, to say something then kicks up a whole plus. For maybe some of you could maybe relate to that uh, feeling. But uh, so I think that that's something that's similar. I think where where perhaps we're dissimilar in society is that uh, I think that there's pushback against some of the excesses of progressives at the ballot uh, box in a way that I don't quite see it here. This country seems pretty split, but um, for example, there's a clinic called the Tavistock. Actually, this isn't quite suit my argument because this isn't, this isn't necessarily about the ballot box, but uh, the government have shut down a, a clinic that uh, pays for and encourages uh, the um, surgery on children to have their sex changed um, and irreversible damage paid for by the state, i.e. paid for me, uh, by me and, and 65 other millions uh, uh, Brits. Um, so, but that's been shut down. So where I'm encouraged is I think that some of the excesses of progressivism, this is 
broader than the arts is being fought back against. So I'm not sure that's a great answer. But. Thank you. A um, uh, question for Lincoln. Um, if, if you look back through history, um, is your sense that these trends that we're seeing today um, have happened in the past? And if so, um, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, I'm no historian, but uh, you know, one thing that comes to mind is Shostakovich and the USSR, and and you know, being utterly under the thumb of uh, the leadership and uh, being told what he could and couldn't write, uh, and it's uh, you know, you don't even have to go back that far. Actually, there was a uh, someone I worked with who had worked with a, uh, a dance company, a modern dance company in Los Angeles that existed in um, the 70s and 80s, I believe, if not longer. And at the time, um, the, the National Endowment of the Arts, and I think it was in the late 80s, instituted a decency clause, uh, which was, uh, to me, similarly vague to diversity, equity, and inclusion requirements um, in that you couldn't produce indecent artwork. Now, it brings up sort of a, a, a tricky question because uh, to me, the, the NEA is, is a difficult thing to begin with because you're taking people's money, taxpayers' money, and you're producing art with it. And to me, that's a little bit of a problem already because you know I'm sure you guys would not be okay with me saying, taking what's in your wallet and bringing you a painting and saying this is what you're gonna hang in your house. So I think that that's a little bit unfair to begin with, but if you're going to do that and then, um, and then have this vague decency clause, uh, that becomes an issue and, and this choreographer refused to sign it and she in fact was instrumental in, I believe, getting the clause removed. Um, I could be wrong about that, but, um, but that's what, what I think is right. And, um, and it's just, I, I, I just don't, we count on artists to be them true, be their true selves. And truth is important because as we can see, it can go out the window. It can go out the window with journalism. Uh, and if no one tells the truth, society can really go in a wrong direction. And, and I was talking to somebody last night um, that was connected with this event that was talking about how deeply important the arts are and, and what, what a power they have. You know, artists are often the, the cool kids in the room and they, the way that they speak uh, touches people very deeply and it can move them. And so I think the arts can be a great corrective uh, and should be a great corrective. So it frightened me when I saw artists that I knew did not agree with the, the things that were, they were being told to do and were saying things that they didn't believe. I, I couldn't believe that, and and I still can't believe it. it it's shocking, and I and I think it's really dangerous. And I, again, I don't know. If that's a good no, answer either. So so do you think that? So is this different? I guess uh, artists have a. I mean, my perception as someone who is not an artist is that artists are by definition nonconformists and uh, striving to do something different, creative. Um, but obviously, what you just described is. Conformity, right? It's it's people who are afraid to stand out. Yeah. And and so is that something that's new? And if so, where do you think that that I, is coming from? I don't think it's new. I think this, you know, it, it, anytime you have uh, authoritarian control, I think they often try to get a, a hold of the artists either by exiling them or getting them under control because they're going to say things. And I, I personally, I don't think uh, artists are necessarily contrarians because they want to be contrarians. I think it's just that they're going to say what they really think, which is often, often not going to be in sync with what um, people want them to say. Um, and so in, in terms of it being different, I don't see it being any different than, than any other time that that's happened. And again, I'm not a historian. It's the first time I've felt it, certainly. And uh, it's scary, man. And, and, I, and I don't, you know, I, I understand why people do it. I mean, like actors, the, the, what you have to do to get a career in acting or in music, I mean, and then to succeed, like 
to be in one of the biggest rock bands in the world, to get there and then you know, have somebody say, well, we're going to take it away unless you remove your tweet. I mean, to stand on your integrity in that scenario is remarkable. And, and I understand why people don't do it, although I think they should. Meg, you, um, you were targeted by six people mm -hmm. initially. And, and yet they were able to lead South by Southwest to apologize not once but twice. No, that, no Sundance apologized. Or, sorry, South Sundance, by Southwest pulled, Sundance pulled the film. to, yeah, to yeah. apologize yeah. twice. Uh, Abigail Disney to mm -hmm. pull her support for the film. Yeah. Um, and you know, ultimately cause other film festivals to, to refuse to show the film or, or to be scared to show the film. That's six people. Yeah. Um, what do you think is different? And I guess specifically, to what extent do you think the, the rise of social media, specifically Twitter, yeah. um, contributed to that happening to your film? Yeah. Well, I'll say this. Uh, through, throughout history, if you're an artist, a filmmaker, a journalist, a writer, painter, whatever, and you make shit, can I say shit? Okay, I can say shit. And you make shit, and you, you put it in the public space. Crit getting criticized is part of that deal. So anyone who makes anything for the public domain, we all know that being criticized is part of putting our stuff in the public space. None of us, at least I'm gonna talk for myself, I don't wanna project, but I have zero problem with criticism. I think a lot of the times it actually makes me a better filmmaker, a better writer, a better artist. Um, and throughout history, there have been people who have criticized works that they didn't agree with. And there's also been people who've attacked works. And I, I do differentiate between criticism and attacking a film. For example, you can tweet, I don't like your film, here are the reason why. But there's between that and you know, taking screenshots of credits and calling people and harassing them and threatening them or or threatening lawsuits unless you change positive reviews and things like that. Um, so that's a bit different. So I want to differentiate the, between the two. But I also think throughout history, you've also had people doing those kind of things. What's different now uh, is that typically you had institutions and leaders who were kind of the protection against that, right? So Sundance used to be a film festival where we showed really edgy work that mainstream studios or broadcasters would never fund. Um, and I always looked at the independent storytelling space as this really sacred place where we were not uh, vulnerable to the sways of whatever political uh, ideology of the day was, because we were independent. We didn't have like advertisers. We had to you know, bend the knee to or any other stuff. So I think for me, what, what's been interesting is to see, the difference now is for me, to see those institutions become victims of this and there's no longer that protection there for artists like me or, or journalists and, and things like that. And to your point about social media, I read, I read this book a while ago called On Writing by Stephen King. Has anyone read that? Yes? Good fucking book. Sorry, that's two. Um, good book. Uh, I, and I remember reading the chapter on criticism. And he said that he used to, this is written in the 90s, so before e email, he said he used to re receive like two to three letters, you know, with the stamps and stuff on it, uh, a week from people criticizing him, uh, accusing him of being misogynistic, homophobic, whatever. And that was kind of, and he, and he said that what he realized is his critics wanted him to, to see and talk about the world the exact same way they saw it. And then anything that devi deviated from that, he, they wanted him to shut up about. Now, he, this was before Twitter. This was before social media. What was interesting to me is in one month, there was one person that tweeted about my film very negatively uh, over 324 times. Now, if Stephen King had received 324 letters in one month from one person, you'd probably take out a restraining order. Um, so the tools at which people can utilize today to amplify their voice can make six people seem like 6,000. And that is something that I think that, at least in my industry, we've neglected to consider when we're talking about films. So for example, 10, 15 years ago, if I came out with a film, I wouldn't know what Laura in Louisiana thought about my film, but today, 
I know what every freaking Laura in the world thinks about my film within two seconds. And that's fine. But I think now when we come out with pieces of work, unless they're universally applauded, they're seen as some kind of failure. But really challenging work is going to be divisive. And it's going to piss some people off. And it's going to be celebrated by other people. And this kind of test that we're doing on social media, and that we're doing, that's why I like this kind of stuff. We're like, I could see you. You're real people. See, I can look you in the eye. We're, we're existing in the same space. You might not agree with me. I might not agree with you. But we're having a conversation, because we're adults. And even though I don't agree with a lot of this stuff that these guys do, what we all agree on is we need to have the conversation. You can't have the conversation if you're not even willing to like, let people show their work and talk about it. And so I would say in terms of social media and how it's like at least as assisted in the cancellation or blacklisting of, of, of my film is that it's six people who most people have never heard of um, being able to have a f huge institution as well respected as Sundance, a multi-billionaire as powerful as a Disney heiress, and a film festival like South by Southwest just completely capitulate. And I had zero idea how far things had gotten until I experienced it. And what's worrying for me is this. Being canceled, if, I, I don't like that word, but being canceled is, is something that when you see it from the outside, it's kind of like, it's kind of like having kids, right? You read books about parenting. You see your friends raise kids. You think you have an idea of how it's supposed to go. And then you like pop that watermelon through that Cheerio, and you're like responsible for human life. And then you realize you have no freaking clue, right? So being canceled looks a certain way. But when you're in it, it's very, very different. And I, so I understand why, to your point, a lot of people capitulate. I understand why a lot of people apologize. Because it's, it's like you're in this eye of the storm that there's no way I could articulate what it feels like. But I don't fault anyone for doing what you, for, for apologizing or for, or for doing that. I, under, I understand that. But I also think if, you, if we have people that continue to do that, this will just go to its natural ending, which having been in places that are lived in places like real authoritarianism, like Saudi Arabia or, or Yemen, uh, it's, it's not a place that you'd want to stay very long. So um, I'm sorry for swearing, but that's my answer. That's a great answer. Is there, I mean, so is part of the, the solution then? Oh, I have to have a solution? Well, it, I, I heard a solution baked into your, your okay. comment there, which is that you were saying that the institutions did not have resilience. The institutions yeah. did not stand up to the six activists. Yeah. Um, so is part of the solution, the institutions, the leaders, um, understanding that the way we communicate has changed. Social media is given yeah. a smaller number of people who are you know, effectively jihadists. Um, uh, definitely would uh, not <laughs> use that term, but OK. <laughs> um, a small number of people who are effectively uh, extremist crusaders, there we go, we'll, we'll balance it, um, that those small number of people are able to uh, amplify their voice. And so institutional leaders need to recognize that. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think that's one. And I also feel like when I was talking to Sundance throughout this whole entire process, it was clear to me that they had absolutely no idea how to handle this. And since then, I've reached out to them to say, hey, this can ne should never happen to another filmmaker. Because I, I will say this, um, I would consider myself a very strong person, a very independent person, a very tough person. And it was extremely hard for me to weather the storm. And I don't think that a lot of people could have done that and come out the other side uh, alive. And I think I've talked to a lot of people since the story came out that have reached out to me and talking about their experiences. and calling me and said, it happened to me too. And a lot of people have said that when it happened to them, they went into a really dark place and they had suicidal tendencies, as did I. And I think that when an institution like Sundance uh, claims to champion independent filmmakers and support independent filmmakers, I think that's horseshit. 
when your independent filmmakers are being attacked and you do nothing. And I'm not saying that it's an institution that needs to go away, but it's a, definitely an institution that needs to have, for lack of a better word, a come to Jesus moment here pretty soon. Because if not, what the, will inevitably happen is they will only program safe films. They're only going to program films that they're, are not controversial or do not push the edge. And those are the films that we actually do need now because those are the ones that spark those conversations and spark those ideas. And even if you don't like them, they make you think. And thinking is a good thing. And I, for me, I love talking to people that I disagree with, who are logical and rational. Because I learned shit. You said the shit was OK. I learned shit when I, when I have those conversations. But if I only talk to people that I completely agree with, it makes me dumber. And I'm already blonde, so let's not do that. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, and, and I feel this is true in acting, in plays, and in music, the most powerful thing in the world, and I could say this having been to countries where there's wars and guns and bombs and all that stuff going on, but the most powerful thing in the world is a story. Stories shape the way you see the world, it's, it's your filter, it's, it, it helps you make decisions, and if you're limiting the stories that people are exposed to, you are fogging that filter at which they can understand the world in which they live. And uh, there's a lot of films that have been made that I think are absolute shit, but I will champion your right to be seen, to be talked about, and to be celebrated, because at the end of the day, even if it's a shit film, it's something that I've been exposed to, and now I've grown a little bit. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Clifton. Uh, March 2020, there was a great piece that I read on BBC, uh, which was anticipating that in a pandemic, um, there, there would be conformity, there would be all the things that we've seen would, would come to be. And, and the argument was this is because when there's a disease out there, when people are fearful, they, they tend toward conformity. And so people who are outliers are ostracized. And so uh, it was an interesting article. And I'm curious, because I, I know for, for you, one of the issues that you uh, had, have had to deal with personally is, uh, is the issue of um, COVID vaccine mandates in, in, uh, in New York and your inability to perform as an actor because you, you personally did not want to take the COVID vaccine. But I'm curious what your thoughts are on the degree to which COVID and the pandemic that we just came through has contributed to this environment, and the degree to which that may give us hope that, that as we are moving past COVID, um, maybe some of these tendencies will, will improve as well. Um. Well, it's funny, my journey is kind of unique because initially um, I was very much uh, what I call a COVIDian. So from January to March 2020, um, you know, I'm, I'm texting my friends, I'm sending them statistics, I'm, you know, I'm telling my brother, like, stock up on, on, you know, all kinds of goods. I still have nitrile gloves, actually, um, from when, you know, from my preparedness. I mean, you know, I mean, I was walking around all these, um, all these Rite Aids and Walgreens in Lower Manhattan for like an hour trying to find masks and everything. So, you know, while everyone else was focused on um, uh, Trump's first impeachment, um, I was like, oh man, something's coming and it's, and it's not something good. Um, that was a West Side Story reference for those uh, who don't know. <laughs> but, uh, it, um, but at the same time, um, and maybe this is the, the bleeding heart in me in, in a way, um, there was already data that was coming out that I was assessing that uh, that uh, suggested that the, um, the infection fatality rate uh, versus the case fatality rate was, um, was thankfully quite low. And on top of that, um, as an actor, you know, we're supposed to be conduits of the human experience and the human vessel and you know, the, all, all that stuff. And I began to feel that a lot of the, the, the actions that we we're being made to take um, in order to mitigate the spread of this uh, disease um, took us away from our core humanity. Um, isolating ourselves, covering up our faces. Um, and um, eventually I said, you know, we can't, we can't live like this forever. And I'm also somebody who um, is very, 
very mistrustful of government and, and sort of anti-authoritarian in that way and, and uh, mistrustful of uh, the state in, in many ways. And um, I saw what I, I thought to be a lot of mismanagement. Um, but what it came down to for me is, um, you know, New York City, or what I call the city formerly known as New York, um, <laughs> it, it, is, it is one of the cultural meccas of the world. Artists from all over the world go to New York to, to make it, to create work. People come from all over the world to see this work. And it really shocked me to see the, the Broadway community, which I, find, I, I worked so hard to, to become a part of. Um, they had this doofus mayor, Bill de Blasio, and this scumbag, Andrew Cuomo, who were telling them that they're not essential. And, you know, I was called selfish for saying, no, we shouldn't shut this down for a protracted period of time because, um, you know, we run the risk of damaging theater culture, theater going, that, that, that habit. But there's also an entire ecosystem of people who also, um, who also, I mean, their jobs are essential to them. You're talking about uh, the concessions workers, the, the snack vendors, the, re the merchandise retailers, the, uh, the security guards, the, you know, the ushers. Um, you have all the bars and restaurants in the area. So you're talking about Broadway in that area, that sphere, um, brings so much life and vitality. It's so core and central to the identity of the city. And, you know, and I was trying to couch it in terms of, well, if we give the government this much power, remember what you know, the Republicans did after 9-11 and what happened after all of that. But um, I, I had sympathy with people who were very afraid. I have friends who <coughs> lost people. Um, at the same time, I'm a big proponent of, of precisely because you can't rely on everybody else to quote unquote, do the right thing, you have even more of an incentive to take care of yourself. And on top of that, you know, we were so beaten down for so long. New Yorkers were so, I mean, I don't know if anybody was there during the time, but that time period, but if you were on the island of Manhattan, you walked out your, your apartment building um, and there were arrows on the sidewalk telling you where to, to, to walk. There were circles telling you where to stand. Um, all these ads on the buses and taxis were telling you, you know, reminding you that you were in this pandemic. Um, it was just a, a, a huge time of, <coughs> of people being terrorized. And I said, you know, after all this time, we deserve as artists to serve the public and nourish their spirit because they're so beaten down by all of this. And, um, and I, I saw that they weren't willing to do that. And I said to myself, well, then, you know, you hear all your, all your life, you're supposed to be, if, if you want to be an actor especially, that's such a soul-crushingly difficult field to, to, be, to be a part of that you, know, you don't want to have to do anything else and you need to be passionate about it. But these people were willing to let um, the government sort of render them non-essential. Meanwhile, you know, the liquor stores are still open, the McDonald's are still open. And- um, Weed dispensaries. And uh, well, not in New York, unfortunately, but- uh, <laughs> Don't do drugs, guys. Um, so, you know, but then on top of that, I saw that these same people, and this kind of ties into 2020 as well, these people who were, after George Floyd died, who were all about um, um, the sort of anti-racist moral panic swept through the industry. Now me, I've been encouraged in my career since I was 17 years old. No one has ever told me that you know, I won't succeed, that I, I won't ever make it. And yet now I'm, I'm, I'm shocked to learn that the industry is racist. And, um, <laughs> You know, and I've, I've probably been the biggest beneficiary of diversity hiring, like, the, of, of any actor ever. And so I saw, you know, I was getting these messages from, like, you know, these aggrieved white women that I worked with who were like, I'm so sorry your life is so hard right now. And I'm thinking to myself, bitch, what are you talking about, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you can say bitch, right? Um, so this one-two punch of, like, because then our unions were sending these messages about, like, you know, the, the show must go on is unjust and it's also racist. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, as performers in New York, we pride ourselves on being tough, on having, on being, uh, on, on having grit, uh, uh, you know. And no matter what, like, obviously, if you're sick, stay, if you're sick, stay home. But, you know, you have an obligation to the audience who's paying hundreds of dollars to sit in these old, cramped-ass seats um, and put on the show that, that they've never seen before. And we completely abdicated that responsibility. And um, on top of that, the, 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 when the vaccines came along, um, I saw the same people who were championing you know, uh, black lives, for instance, turn around and say, well, you niggers can't come into my restaurant or into my bar. You know, you can't, I don't even want uh, uh, to 
um, perform for an unvaxxed audience member. And I'm thinking to myself, guys, look at the demographics of who is not taking the, the, the shot. For whatever reason, they're not taking it. It's blacks and Latinos. So you're discriminating against the very same people that you claim to want in your audience right now. Um, there, was no, there was no ability to think about it. There was, no, there was nothing going on because everyone had in their minds that it was a bunch of like redneck, knuckle-dragging Trump supporters who weren't taking the shot. I'm like, guys, no, there's a wide range of people. Um, I feel like I'm rambling a lot um, and trying to get to the core of your question, but um, so I, 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 I feel like I, I, I don't know if, if I would trust those people again to restore, um, to restore everything from, to what it was now. Because now I see these articles that are coming out about uh, audiences being slow to return, both here and, and overseas uh, after the pandemic. They've scared their core audience from coming. With all the mandates and COVID protocols, they've, they've alienated the, their domestic and their foreign audience. I mean, Broadway lives on tourist dollars in, in a big way. Lots of revenue there. Um, and you know, I joke now that uh, you know I, I have a lot of sour grapes, but I, but I wash it down with some Schadenfreude, so which takes it, you know, makes it really sweet. <laughs> um, and so my my thing is, in terms of hope and trying to find an, another way out, there have to be more dissident voices to come together who who say. I understand risk assessment, and I'm, I'm data literate, and I'm not enumerate, and I know, and I trust everyone else to take care of themselves. And we need to build something new, because these people have demonstrated now that are in the machine that they're not fit for purpose in terms of maintaining that machine. That was a long-winded rant. I know I didn't get to the core of your question, I'm sorry, but no, no, I have a, a lot of feelings about it. That was fantastic, thank you. Um, I, I think the, the, the piece that I'm, that I'm still wondering about is to what extent, and I'll open this up to anyone on, on the panel, uh, to what extent do you think that, uh, that our emergence from the pandemic may help these, this conformity, the, you know, these, the, these recent changes that, that you've seen in, in, in the arts um, to self-correct? Because these are systemic issues, right? Yeah. Um, I think, because, so, so Sundance this year was supposed to be in person, and then I think it was like two weeks before uh, it went virtual because of Omicron. And I had a conversation with m many people, both in and out of Sundance, that kind of all said the same thing. They said, if, you know, if this film festival would have been in person, this wouldn't have happened to your film. Because what you, well, you would have been there with a group of other people who saw the same film that you did, you had this discussion, and realized that those six people were just the angry six people outside and there was 150 people who actually saw the film and liked it. Uh, so I think that sometimes there's a perfect storm of things. I also know that like a lot of people that I knew during the pandemic um, spent a lot more time online uh, than they normally did. And uh, just from being in a world for the last dec half decade, um, that is, uh, you know, interviewing extremists and terrorists and, and who a lot of them subscribe to a certain ideology, and, and seeing how that can spiral out of, out of control. I think that like seeing when you go online and, and you're, you're fed things that are either in line or, or very, very close to in line of what you're believing, you don't really get to have those conversations or, or have those views challenged that you do in real life, right? So like if we all sat down, it obviously would be a very big table and had the discussion and, and you said something and that I didn't agree with, I would say something back to you. But if you've sat at a table and every single person at that table was your doppelganger, you would just think that you're brilliant and everything you say is amazing. And I think it is in order to be a fully functioning society, especially in the arts, you have to have those kind of disagreements in a civil and constructive way. And I think that's what's being lost on social media because on Twitter, you're either a hero or you're a villain. There's no nuance. There's no complexity, and the world is just not made of heroes and victims, and it's not made of uh, evildoers and, and, and good people. It's made of humans who, in all their complexities, and all their flaws, and all the idiosyncrasies that make us beautiful living beings. And I think to, to ignore that and to, and to flatten human beings, and what I mean by that is the flattening of humans is very alarming to me because I, I am a Gen Xer, and we, my generation was much more, did not like conformity, did not like being put in boxes, like fought against that ferociously. And so now I'm being told that I, I have boxes that I need to check. I am a female filmmaker. 
I, I, I'm not just a filmmaker. And I think that there's a lot of things now that ignore huge parts of who I am and who huge parts of what makes me me. And I think that that particular element of the online discussion is being, and the nuance and the complexity is being lost on, on forums like Twitter and, and whatnot. Although, you know, it's useful for some things. Uh, to what extent do you think that uh, requirements placed on grants by foundations and, and other philanthropists has driven some of what's happening in the arts? Um, and, and I think, Lincoln, you talked to this a, a bit, but to what extent, you know, that's, that's a, it seems like that is a systemic change that has taken place where foundations are now requiring requiring discrimination in, in their grant making, um, for example. But to what extent do you think that that's part of, the, the money is part of what's driven the shift in mindset by people within the arts community? Uh, it's enormous. In the performing arts, and I, I don't know how this compares with uh, museums um, and other, other arts, but I imagine it would be somewhat similar. In the performing arts, generally 50, 30 to 50% of your uh, income and in your budget is is uh, ticket sales. The rest is grants and um, donations. And so, I mean, it was essentially they can turn off the lights. You know, if if you uh, say, I mean, I, I would say if you pulled three or four large grants from any organization. Uh, that could be catastrophic for them. And so um, to me, that's what drove this so fast when all I was hearing from people personally was, no, we don't agree with this. We don't want to discriminate. But uh, I, one uh, gentleman I spoke to who was a, an executive director, had been an executive director of major organizations and, um, and uh, was a consultant, I spoke with him and I said, I'm not okay with this. I'm not going to go along with it. He said, it's absolute suicide. And so, um, and you know, speaking with people that I know are on the boards of these organizations uh, that don't agree with this, I think you had a situation where if you've got a boardroom of a foundation and you've got 10 people and two are screaming, you have to do this or you're racist, you know, most of the rest of the people are gonna say, I, I guess I'm not racist, you know, and, and they'll go along with it, and then that drives this change in the policy, and then all of their grantees now have to change their missions um, and go along with it. And so it just, uh, I think it's, it's utter. I think that's why you saw such a sweeping, you know, grand DEI statements placed all over arts organizations and people apologizing and so forth um, for their past racism and, and things like that is because this became the way that you get funding. And, um, so yeah, it was, it, it was really like somebody said, your integrity or your life's work, choose. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I thought that was it. I thought for me, I, I didn't think I couldn't choose to be dishonest about what I believed, but I did think it was likely the end. Meg, what have you seen in the documentary film industry? <laughs> um. I'll just give an example. So there's a lot of fellowships and uh, grants in the documentary world, and um, I was didn't get really any grants. I think I got like we got like one five thousand dollar small one, um, but we didn't pretty much. We applied to think over like sixty. We didn't get any for this particular film. And one of the times I was I, the feedback I was given was I had to have a uh, Muslim co-director. And then I said, you know, can you suggest someone? And the, they suggested a Pakistani American man who had uh, didn't speak Arabic, had had never been to Saudi Arabia, but he was a Muslim. And uh, because my co-producer at the time was Saudi and lived in Saudi Arabia and was Muslim, I didn't think that he was a value add. And so I said, uh, I don't think that's a it's, it's 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 a box that you seem just to want to tick. But I will say, I'll back that up with with when you're talking about boards and and funding. I, I did do a fellowship uh, at a place called IFP, which is now called Gotham, and it was a uh, fellowship for first-time feature filmmakers. I went through that program, 
And part of the deal is you have to credit them in your credits, your film. And um, when it was announced that the film got into Sundance, I was contacted by the head of the program who reminded me to put my name or put the name of the organization in the credits and said, you know, this is your, you have to do this, it's contractual by accepting the fellowship. I was like, yeah, of course, we'll, we'll acknowledge you. And then um, when the controversy started, that same organization that uh, told us we had to acknowledge them in our credits uh, substantially or, or, or subsequently issued a, a public apology for supporting the film in the first place. And because I knew the head of the program, I called him up and I was like, dude, what the F word? Um, and he said uh, plainly that, I was like, you've seen my film, you know what it's about, why would you apologize for something like that? And he said the board, the board said that we had to do something because there was just too much pressure. There was just too much <sighs> public outcry. And then I asked him one question. I said, well, has the board seen the film? No. And therein lies the problem. When you are making decisions on pieces of artwork, pieces of journalism, pieces of, of, of filmmaking uh, that you have not seen, but you are apologizing for, you are reinforcing a lie that's being told about it. And you can watch the film and not like it. I welcome that. But do not not read a book. Do not not see a film. Do not not see a play and then attack it or then apologize for it. And so I think for me, when I say these institutions failed, these institutions not only failed, but they perpetuated this um, ideology of if a, f a few people are upset, we have to apologize. Rather than saying a few people are upset, this is something that maybe we should talk about. Maybe this is something we should discuss even further. Maybe this is something we should explore. And maybe we can find something new and learn something new. So yeah, I think that it, it was really distressing to me to see Gotham, South by Southwest, Sundance, leaders in the industry like Abigail at Disney um, do those kinds of things. And uh, you know, it's very disheartening. But I, I also remember a quote someone told me recently that said, you know, Abigail Disney and at Sundance, they have like, you know, millions of dollars and, and you know, uh, resources. And someone told me that the only thing more dangerous than a man with limitless resources and more money than God is a man that has nothing to lose. And I feel sometimes when you're in this position, you lose everything and the only thing you do have left is your integrity and to hold on to that is what I would encourage people to do. That's it. So for... I mean, we're, we're, I think what all of you have described are systemic issues, right? These are, these are not isolated incidents. These are, exa these are just examples of, of what is happening systemically. Um, so in the face of a systemic problem, you have a few options, right? One is to, and there's probably more options than this, but one is to create new institutions. Um, another is to try to work with the existing institutions and try to try to address the systemic issues. Um, what are your thoughts on, the, on the, the approach to solve these problems? Well, I'm somebody who thinks that uh, my attitude is let the current institutions burn. Um, I don't really see them being salvaged in any meaningful way. Um, I think the solution is for people to create new institutions alongside, you know, to, to compete with those older institutions. I think what is fantastic, and uh, Winston and I were talking about this right before uh, the presentation is that, or the uh, panel, is that uh, there are more and more dissident artists who are, who are coming together and finding each other and who are saying, I'm sick of all of this. And, um, we live in an era now where we have all this technology available. We have all these different sorts of um, resources available to, you know, to from crowdfunding to, uh, uh, you know, Patreon or whatever, where artists can support themselves and uh, connect directly with uh, their their core audience or whatever. Um, and uh, the only issue is that <laughs> it can be kind of 
with artists, it's kind of like herding cats sometimes. Um, you know, I, I, often, I often joke that uh, you know, if I were to start a theater company, I, I just want to focus on you know, the acting, let some, uh, some staunch conservative or whatever run the company uh, so they can, and keep the kids in line. Um, but I think on top of that, there's, um, like you were saying before, Winston, that there's some pushback against this. And there's a, I think there's a big realignment taking place. And I see a lot of people from different um, walks of life, from different ideologies, different political perspectives, who are all kind of converging and seeing the same things. And I think people are willing to work together because they see that the issue is sort of bigger than their little uh, socio-political idiosyncrasies. Um, so I think. I think the, the better solution is to go and build new stuff and to find a way. Like I say right now, like with, with Broadway uh, or the entertainment industry in general, it's like, you know, for a long time I felt like a lot of people, they weren't really trying to perform for the public at large. It was really more about appeasing a bunch of sort of snooty, quote unquote, progressives in New York and LA. But now, you know, since I kind of was purged, I, I found a, a global audience. And so that to me is like winning. And so if enough of us can come together and build institutions where now we have this technology where we can share with the entire world, um, I think that's a really, really um, cool thing. So I think the energy is better spent um, investing in building new institutions. And, you know, I mean, the, new, the old ones, the old machines is going to be there, I think. I don't know if it'll ever go away, um, but I don't know if they're really salvageable um, at this point. So I think, you know, new, new, new is my, my attitude on that. I don't, I don't know, maybe it's this firefighter in me, but I don't know if I want to burn that whole house down just yet. <laughs> I didn't say burn it down, let, let, let it Let it burn? You know. so, but, I don't know, I kind of want to go in and put a little bit of it out, a little bit. Well, I mean, like, you, you can do it, that's fine. I don't say, like, like, those, they'll be there. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that they'll go away, but I'm saying that my energy, I feel like, is better spent building something new. And I, I, th I, I, I agree with that in terms of, I do think that in the immediate future, those institutions are not salvageable in the immediate future, in terms of right now, today. I, but I do know, just from talking to people, that there are people within that institution, i.e. Sundance, <coughs> who fought tooth and nail against what was happening. So there are good people in these institutions, they are, but you have to seek them out. And I think that, like, although I, I agree with you, there needs to be something built outside of that uh, a nexus that is really devoted to f artistic freedom of expression. I also feel that those institutions, if they can look at themselves in the mirror and see at some point when this goes to where it's going to go, do a self-correction or, or have people in there that are stronger or, or braver to be able to champion some of these things, I do think that it's something that I think is worth a little bit of my energy as well. I mean, I'm totally like 80% in your camp. I'll, I'll give 20% to trying to um, reach out to the people in, within those institutions that are screaming from the talk in their lungs, but unfortunately, they don't yet have a microphone. Well, see, then my, my question, or my, I would say it's a rebuttal, because one thing that I've been disappointed by is the people who reach out to me privately and they say, man, I, I agree with you, but I just, I can't say anything because I've, I've got kids to feed and I've got yeah. this and that. So then, you know, another question becomes, is it a psychological thing? Is it a cultural thing to encourage? Because I feel like, you know, when people come up to me and they say, oh, you know, you're so brave for doing this and that, I'm like, I don't really think so because I feel like a lot of people actually agree with, yeah. with, with me, but they just, for, for whatever reason, they don't come up and say anything. And I wonder if more, if, more people within these institutions realize that maybe they had more people on their side, maybe they would speak up. Um, I mean, I, I would love for that, but I've also been very disappointed by seeing people who choose instead to remain silent and, um, you know, for whatever reason, maybe it's an economic incentive, they don't want to be, you, you used the term, which I love uh, earlier, uh, weaponized empathy, nobody wants to feel like they're a bad person. Yeah. Um, so that's a very, very strong social pressure. Um, you know, so, in terms of salvaging those institutions, I mean, there has to be some way to overcome those two, those two massive pressures. I think what it probably would take is the pain of capitulation um, would only be eclipsed 
uh, or the, the, the pain of capitulating needs to be more um, stronger than the, the pain of not. Does that, do you, do you understand what I'm saying there? Okay. Right now, though, capitulating means you still keep your nice job with a lot of but that's, money. But that's what I'm You're saying. Right. Like, so for example, like if, 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 if I'm calling you out and you feel that pressure and you apologize, not because you did anything wrong, but because you want to make it stop, the pain stop. Um, the pain of making it stop is why people are doing it now. But if the pain of capitulating is greater than that, or the, or the repercussions are greater than that, then that could turn the ship. I'm not saying that's what I want, but I'm saying that that probably would be the only thing in the immediate future to do that. Or if it's economically more viable as well, because I do think that's actually starting to happen. You are losing audiences, you are losing, so I think in some ways that's already taking place. But I also feel that like, socially anyway right now, it's not economic, socially it's still not the case. Can I just suggest, I think you guys are actually agreeing. Um, and, and the reason I think that is because what I'm hearing from Clifton is we need new institutions. And you're saying we need existing institutions. We can't burn them down, right? I think, I think that Clifton's point, as I'm taking it, is that new institutions will put competitive pressure yeah. on the existing institutions. And so ultimately, yeah. If the hypothesis is correct that these institutions are out of touch with what the exhausted majority of people really want, then having new institutions will put competitive pressure on them and will lead them in the right direction. Yeah, if I made a film festival tomorrow and had Christopher Nolan and Uratu and all these other people only want to premiere at my festival, that would be a game changer. <laughs> so yeah, they wouldn't because I'm a nobody, but I'm just saying hypothetically <laughs> if that happened, that would be a game changer. There's somebody to me, man. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think we're, we're short on time. The, the one question I just briefly for you, Winston, is um, can you just, before we move on to the audience questions, just share one thing that gives you hope? Uh, well, this certainly gives me hope, meeting young uh, uh, other artists who are prepared to uh, put their necks on the line for what they believe in. And there are many other artists uh, I've had the pleasure of interviewing on my uh, podcast. We were talking about Rosie Kay, a British choreographer who was uh, forced to resign from her own dance company that she'd founded for having gender critical opinions. And now she's studying her own. Uh, uh, there are various comedians, I think, in America. Shane Gillis, I don't know if you're familiar with this, this guy, uh, was hired for SNL and then they uh, sacked him because they dug through his old comedy and found him saying racial slurs in comedy, including against his own race. So it was a part of the joke. I haven't actually heard it, so I should probably check what he said before I defend him. <laughs> but, but from what I understand, it was, a, it was a joke. And he's now a very successful comedian uh, who's gone it alone. And, and you can, and there are plenty of examples of people. Lucy Kay, he's got his own platform. Uh, doing his own website and use, instead of using the institutions that we so describe. And, and so what gives me hope is that you can actually do, if you have a vision, you have something you want to create, you can do a decent amount without the help of these institutions about which we speak. Wonderful. So uh, before we open up audience questions, I'd just like to thank our panel. <laughs>
There's uh, Paul Gad or Gary Glitter. Uh, who is an artist without sin? And if, if you're not going to be able to um, uh, listen to an artist or read an author because they've done something wrong, then art is, is finished. You have to rule it out. Now, I personally draw a line where I say, if I am funding nefarious activity by the artist, by uh, consuming, purchasing the art, then that's my line. So actually, Gary Glitter would be an example. I don't know if you're familiar with this guy. So I think he's British. Uh, in Thailand, paedophilic kind of stuff going on, and he's still alive. And, and I know if you listen to his music, that's, you're funding that lifestyle. So I, like, I won't listen to him for that reason. And I might get done for libel <laughs> in case I've got that wrong. <laughs> uh, but that's my line. Bootleg, a bootleg version where he doesn't get paid. <laughs> That, that, yeah, I, I, I would probably be OK with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a bit of hate. Uh, let's say, just in case, for libel reasons, I've got that wrong. <laughs> let's, say, let's say he was doing that, is what I meant to say. <laughs> Hypothetically. <laughs> um, oh. Winston was jamming to R. Kelly on the way here. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but now, R. Kelly, you can listen to it, but he's no longer, you wouldn't be funding that behavior, because he can't do that anymore, right? But they, well, am I getting that wrong? Who's got the R. Kelly story? Who understands? Well, I think you can send him money through. He's in jail. <laughs> He's in jail. He's in prison. Yeah. Don't fund me. You know, I think is the way that you phrase the question, you know, is the art an extension of the artist? I think absolutely. Yeah. But that doesn't mean because an artist has a bad idea or did something wrong that the art is infected with that bad idea. You know, people make bad decisions. People have erroneous ideas. But like Wagner is a case of a composer who was, uh, I think pretty deeply anti-Semitic, uh, but also changed music. And so I don't think that you have to, to uh, even though that is, the music is an extension of him and maybe the anti-Semitism is an extension of him, it doesn't mean the music is an extension of anti-Semitism. Yeah, and also in, I, in film school, I remember uh, we literally studied and watched and dissected Triumph of the Will. Does anyone know what Triumph of the Will is? Letting Roof and Stall. Letting Roof and Stall? No? All right, you guys got some homework to do. Okay, put in Lenny Roof and Stall, Triumph of the Will. She was basically. So just to be clear, you're recommending. I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm just saying you should know who she is. But like, she was. She is. She was a Nazi. She did the first big budget documentary funded by Hitler, right? And they they did all these new camera moves that had never been seen before, uh, and we study that in almost every film school. We all know Nazism bad, right? I mean, I hope we all know that. But like we study the techniques used in that. So it's like a lot of these things that you're talking about, if you're talking about getting rid of that all together, then I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I still listen to Michael Jackson. Does that answer your question? I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Really? Awesome. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Hi there. Um, I'm seeing some parallels between the story of Socrates and this fight and how Socrates is kind of the gadfly um, who promotes truth but also um, provokes in a way. And my Are you a philosophy major? Uh, no, I'm a scuttle major. <laughs> um, my question would be, would you agree with that analysis? And if so, do you think that Socrates can be his own savior in this fight? Who is Socrates? Fucking no idea how to answer that question. <laughs> Absolutely none. <laughs> Yeah, that's also something uh, else. I mean, absolutely. I mean, essentially, we're being accused with corrupting the youth of Athens. So it's, uh, I think, a very apt analogy. And um, whether or not Socrates can save himself, I think, you know, Socrates was at the end of his life. But if he had been a little bit younger and stood up for himself, um, you know, I think he made a pretty grand statement. But if he had stood up for himself, and, and I think that the key thing, you know, you guys were talking about whether or not to burn down the institutions or keep them. You know, institutions are made of people. And if uh, there, there was a study done, and I, I wish I knew it better. I was actually talking about it last night, where they gathered a bunch of subjects in a room. And essentially, they presented them with three lines, one which was the longest, clearly, like line A, one which was medium length, line B, and one which was the shortest, line C. And they found that if they got a few people to say that line B was the longest, which it clearly wasn't, the rest of the room had trouble saying what they thought the truth was. But they found that if they could, and if they found that they got one dissenter, 
people still had trouble. But if they got two dissenters in the room, then people started feeling comfortable. So I think it is, the, for the institutions, for everything, it's about people, you know, I think it's important. Somebody's got to go first, and you've got the firsts up here. And then somebody's got to go second. And then I think it, it picks up momentum. So I think it, it genuinely is. So it, it, my answer is yes. You need two Socrates. You need two Socrates. Well, yes, that's two that's Socrates. Right. Thank Excellent. You. Two Socrates, one cup. Hi. Uh, first of all, just wanted to thank you all for being here. I respect you all immensely. It's a difficult position you've all been in. Um, my question is specifically for Meg. Oh, wow. And so I, and, but I think the broader point is something you can all address. Um, so I wonder if this, this outrage and the sort of cancel culture that we've discussed here, if this has a broader effect, um, not, not just on the people who are outraged, the sort of group thing that you talked about, Winston, um, but also on, on the people who are being accused themselves and the people who may find themselves in the camp of the accused. Um, and so specifically with your film, I, the characterization you've made of your critics is that it's, it's six people that have sort of... It started. I should say it start, started, started. It started as six started people. As six and, and I, I'm not going to claim to be an expert in this. I didn't yeah. do any reporting myself. But it seems that the criticism blossomed because some experts seem to find other issues with the film as well. Um, uh, namely, I mean, especially people who, who follow the region and, and uh, people who are familiar with Guantanamo Bay and the pressures that may be on those pr uh, prisoners. Um, and I will also note that they, they also noted that you, they don't think you had malicious intent. But, but I wonder if, if this whole conversation, does, does it make it harder for, for you in your position to, does it make it easier to sort of cocoon into your, into your idea, or not, I don't want to say your ideas, but in, into your side and make it di more difficult to consider as someone who may take your, your position um, whether or not uh, there, there may be some merit to the argument? Yeah, I think for me, I mean, obviously you don't know this, but like right after Sundance, immediately after Sundance, uh, my first thing was like, did I miss something? Because there's no way that when you have that kind of response that unless you're completely tone deaf that you just don't take a step back and be like, whoa, what's, what's going on? And so right after Sundance, I did not one, not two, but three test screenings. The first was a group where I went to them and I said, okay, raise your hand if you've never heard about this film before. Half the people raised their hand. Raise their hand if you've uh, gone on Twitter or read some of the op-eds. Other half raised their hand. And they watched the film. And down the line, everyone who came in cold had a positive experience with the film. Everyone who went on Twitter first had all these problems. And we got their feedback, and it was all written. And, and so it was like, OK, let's dive into some of these problems. Like, what was the biggest problem? And this woman raised her hand, and she said, well, it was clear by watching your film that these men were scared for their life, and they were uncomfortable with you filming them. Which having done 30 test screens before Sundance and never having feed that, that feedback was a bit out of the blue for me. So I said, OK, let's dive into this. What specifically in the film gave you that impression? And she said, well, it was clear as day in that one scene where one of the main characters goes on furlough from this rehab center, and he visits his cousin. And during that time in the scene, I'm talking to his cousin. His cousin says, you know, you know we took two buildings from you, but you took two countries from us. And it's a very, very intimate moment. But that whole entire time, the main character is staring straight ahead and not involved in the conversation whatsoever. And so this person says, it's clear that he didn't want to be filmed. It's clear he was scared for his life because he's looking straight ahead. He's not even involved in the conversation. He won't even look at you. It's clear that he's scared. And I said, wow, that's a very so, so, a strong statement. So you're saying that he's scared for his life because he's not talking to me. He's not looking at me. He's just kind of ignoring me and the camera. I said, yes, it's exactly what's going on. I said, OK. Uh, would it at all change your opinion to know that when you make a documentary film, there's a TV or a radio playing in the background, you have to mute it. And that character, his name was Nader, is a huge soccer fan. And behind me, while I'm filming, there was a soccer game on. And it was his favorite team. And that's why he's staring straight ahead, because he's watching that game. And you can't hear it, because it's muted. And my point in telling that story is how strong confirmation bias can be. And so after that screening, what I realized that I needed to do is I needed to take the film to a group of people that if they were going to have a problem with it, 
would be would, would would see it, but see it cold. So they, I didn't tell them anything about the film. I didn't tell them the title. I didn't tell them anything about the subject matter or the controversy. But I screened the film for a group of people that I thought if they were going to have a problem with it, I would hear about it from them. And I was the Yemeni Student Union at one of the major universities in the Bay Area. And across the board, after we screened it, absolutely loved it. With the exception of one guy who thought we, had to, we, we, were, we needed to go harder on the Saudis. But with his exception, everyone else loved the film. <laughs> um, and what that said to me was that confirmation bias is very strong, and that some of the people who know about this specific topic, uh, like Lawrence Wright, who wrote The Looming Towers, like Ali Soufan, like Graham Wood. So Graham Wood is a reporter who works at the Atlantic. He's been to Saudi Arabia several times. He's been to the rehab center itself. And he's also interviewed MBS. So when I talk about people who know about this, that's specifically what I'm talking about. People who actually been to the kingdom, been to these places, and have a plethora of knowledge towards it. Now when it comes to as a journalist, when you, when you have a claim like this, what's being lobbied at the film, so you're right, it first started out with six people, but then there was an activist group in the UK that got involved called CAGE. CAGE is a group that is not for people, most Americans are not familiar with, but when you're in, if you're in the UK, you are, they're a very nefarious group, and they attack any film or book with misinformation or whatnot, or just straight up lying or lawsuits to try to get it silenced. And so then they enter the picture. And unfortunately, um, a lot of people didn't do their research and started reposting what they were saying, and that got spread. And it wasn't until you had real investigative journalists like the New York Times, Pulitzer Prize winner Michael Powell, or like or Graham Wood, or, or, or uh, Sebastian Younger, that they actually dived into this and realized there's no there there. So I think what this whole experience has taught me is that I don't believe that if something like this happens to your film piece of work, the immediate thing to be to say is like I'm not wrong. I think it. it I'm very glad that I kind of had a gut check. I'm very glad that we did those test screenings, because at the end of the day, uh, I'm not perfect. Where none of you are. I hate to break it to you. We all make mistakes, and it is good, especially when you're doing something this controversial in terms of the topic to have a gut check every once in a while, and to be humble about that. However, having done not one, not two, but three test screenings with Yemenis and Muslims and, and, and post-Sundance, and then sending the film to real experts like Lawrence Wright, Ali Soufan, and other people like that, and having those, having the, what the film was said back to me, real experts in Guantanamo, what you have to understand is like, as a journalist, my ethics are different than someone who's a human rights activist. For example, if I'm trying to close Guantanamo, I'm going to tell you everyone in there is innocent and this is wrong. And I understand that because you're trying to push a, uh, an agenda forward. And I want Guantanamo closed. But as a journalist, I still have to tell the truth even if it's inconvenient. And even if it goes against that movement. For example, when the Me Too movement came out, it was Believe All Women. But unfortunately, the truth is, not every single woman on the face of the earth tells the truth. And so as a journalist, you have to acknowledge the nuance and that there are stories that are horrific, but there are stories that also need to be talked about that aren't, that are being overblown, i.e. painting the same brush of someone like Harvey Weinstein with Aziz Ansari. There's no nuance there. So in terms of, I, I, I don't think that you should completely ignore critics or ignore your attackers, but you should also, once you do your due diligence, realize if you are not in the wrong, you should not apologize and you should stand by the work that you did. But if you are in the wrong, fuck yeah, like be like, my bad. And that's part of growing and being a human being. I'd love to add some context to this one because uh, <clears throat> I'm one of the few people apparently that has seen the film and I'd heard the things about it going into it. And I can tell you that it's, in terms of cancellations and things you hear, it's one of the most absurd experiences I've ever had. It would be like being, hearing that uh, there's this anti-Semitic film out there, and then you go see Schindler's List, and you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm missing something, right? This is a joke. <laughs> and so it's, it's, uh, it's not just like, did she do enough soul searching? It was, ex it was just absurd to uh, an unbelievable degree. Does that answer your question? 
kit, can I follow up shortly? You get short, short. I, the, the short, short is just, do you think it was harder because of the overall outrage to, to do that like gut check that you talk about? Or is... uh, I mean, like I said before, there's three types of people in the world. Mm -hmm. I was being attacked. So the whole the, the reason for me to do that gut checks is how am I like well why are they why are they like why are they attacking me I need to figure this out so that's just kind of my go to um, so that wasn't hard what was hard was uh, seeing people that I respected seeing people that I cared about and considered friends just completely either jumping ship or or throwing me under the bus or that that was hard um, but once I did my due diligence I realized that. I didn't have anything to apologize for. So yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, Okay. thank you. Um, so we have about five minutes left, so we'll but try to keep the now. answers brief because we've got three more people to ask questions. Yeah, uh, I think I can ask this quickly. Um, I think a lot of the issues started with uh, when the personal became political, kind of when people's identities became so engrossed in their political belief system and kind of how they projected those onto others as well and were scared of retaliation. Um, and then I was also listening to, a, uh, just for context, a podcast with Douglas Murray maybe like a year and a half ago. And I remember him saying how uh, he wished he could be doing anything but writing The Madness of Crowds. Like it was using up all of his inte intellectual energy, but he felt like it was the most important thing in the moment. My question is, um, y'all are all artists and I'm sure you wanna also be doing something else. And I'm curious, how do you see people and artists moving past this? Like, is it ever going to be possible again to get out of the political being the personal, especially within the arts? Is there an audience for it anymore? Like, uh, agnostic kind of art. That, yeah. And that's for anyone. Focus on the work. Um, I, I never got into acting like, like uh, Lincoln said earlier. Like, I never got into the acting to be an activist. It was just like one of the something I was good at, and uh, I got a lot of encouragement in it. Um, you know, especially as a, as a minority, you know, you, you face all these sort of mental hurdles that you have to go over. And, you know, once I was able to get past this idea of, well, how, are my, how, are, how is a, a white audience going to perceive what I'm doing? How are my black colleagues going to perceive how I'm doing? Then I could focus on playing Caliban, who was a slave. You know, I mean, I, I played it in D.C. And my costume literally, you know, had chain. I had chains on me. So I was the guy who was in the room. I knew people were going to be like, "Oh my God!" We, but I said, "No, throw me around the room. Like, do what. Let, 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 like, let, let's go for it." Because that's because the text supports that, and people will respond. And people are still going to complain, whatever. But you know, they'll they'll respond to the authenticity of what we're doing and the strength of what we're doing. And right now, you know, I have a few sonnets on my YouTube channel. And what I've loved is that people respond really positively to it. Um, I spoke to um, the conservative scholar Victor Davis Hanson about the importance of Greek tragedy. People love these conversations. They just want to see really good work. There's always room for good work. So that's how you get past it, is focus on what the work is, in my opinion. I want to add to that. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Freedom of speech, my ass. <laughs> uh, I think that all good work comes from a place of authenticity, to your point. But in order to do that kind of work, you need to be extremely vulnerable. And that is nearly impossible to do if you're constantly being attacked. And so my, when you're talking about you know, moving forward, I think it's about making an environment for yourself as an artist where you surround yourself with people that you don't feel attacked. And you can start making that work again that comes from our authentic place, that comes from vulnerability. And what I, the one thing I like about coming here is I've met three people that I have never known before, and we've had these conversations, and I feel like I might have been kicked out of one community, but I'm starting to build another. And, that's, and that, for me, means that I'm going to be able to start making work and being vulnerable again, which is nice. Real quick question for Maggie. So you went through the whole fiasco with Sundance. What did they learn from this, and what are they going to do different? My, my mom calls me Maggie. No one else calls me Maggie. Oh, but like, hey. <laughs> no, it's cool. I miss my, I miss my mom. Uh, I don't know. You have to ask them. I, I, I have not. Uh, I sent them an email uh, like over a month ago um, wanting to talk to them, being like, hey, I don't think you're, because their Sundance is coming around this again pretty soon, and I, and I think they're going to make their selections, announce it sometime this month, and I don't think they're prepared to deal or support or protect their filmmakers um, 
when this, not if, but when this happens again. So I, I don't know, I haven't heard from them. I've tried to reach out to, to try, again, to try to not burn the house down, but hey, like this is something we need to, we need to address. But I have not, they have not returned any of my emails. Is it possible, sorry, is it possible for art to have a neutral view viewpoint to begin with? And are we aiming for art to have a neutral viewpoint? Or are we just looking for a different viewpoint than progressivism? Sorry, okay. I was gonna say, you know, I, I'm someone who says you can have your point of view and that can inform the work. In fact, if you go in and read um, the Albert Maltz essay that I, that I referred to, um, you know, he talks about the social utility of, of the arts. My, my thing is, have that opinion, let it inform the work, but don't let it overwhelm the craft. That's my, that's my thing. So whatever your opinion is, that's fine, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll grow and learn something from that. But just make sure that what you're doing is good and, 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 and meaningful and powerful. That's my only thing. I would also say, I mean, like, art, to, consider ballet, right? Uh, you have... Um, beautiful dancers dancing to Tchaikovsky. That's not a progressive viewpoint, that's not a conservative viewpoint, but it's art. So it doesn't, this, there doesn't have to be um, a political viewpoint inherent in art. I also think that there, at least in the, in the documentary film space, there are documentaries that are issue-based docs, and that's what they want to do, and I think that's great. And I think that there are docs that are just poetic, like you watch them and it's, it's just this poetic experience. But I also feel like this, I did not get into documentary filmmaking to save the world. I got into documentary filmmaking to help understand the world. And I don't know if that's agnostic, but um, that was just my motivation. Uh, I think that if it's a political viewpoint that you're trying to push, then it's not art, it's propaganda. And actually, to tie into an earlier conversation about institutions, the Daily Wire have started their own institutions creating their own films, for example. And my impression is that they are fighting fire of fire and being the antithesis to Hollywood instead of being the example of what Hollywood should be. And so uh, when we talk about institutions, I don't think it's about doing the opposite. It's about being the example in, ac in, in, in academia, as uh, relevant to here. Uh, we've seen in, in America the Austin University and the Ralston College in Savannah being two examples of universities not being the opposite and, and, uh, of, of the progressive university. Instead, they're being the example of what a university should be. Art that is political isn't art, it's propaganda. You, you could see this with Ayn Rand, for example. She's the c c conservative version, but it's, but it's propaganda because she's pushing an agenda instead of it being about the human experience. Thank you. Great, I think, I think that is it, so. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for that thoughtful and And please join me in a final thanks to Byron, uh, Lincoln, Meg, Clifton, and Winston.